Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast, the place for first-gen students of color to prepare for grad school. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Bu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into and successfully navigate grad school. For over 10 years, I've been helping first-gen students of color get into top grad programs in their field, and I'm really excited to support you on your academic journey too. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Yvette, and today we're going to be covering not one, but two exciting topics. The first one is on building a sustainable writing practice, and the second is on using multimodal pedagogies in the classroom. I feel like each of them could be its own podcast, so maybe we'll have to have you come back to the show. <laughs> but yeah, but for now, I'm gonna get as much as I can because I'm so excited that our guest today is Ariana Brown. She, they, Ariana is a queer Black Mexican American writer based in Houston, Texas. The author of the poetry collections We Are Owed and Sana Sana. Ariana's work investigates queer Black personhood in Mexican American spaces loneliness and care. I just got chills. She holds a BA in African Diaspora Studies and Mexican American Studies, an MFA in Poetry and MS in Library Science. Ariana is a National Collegiate Poetry Slam champion and owes much of her practice to performance communities led by Black women poets from the South. She has been writing, performing, and teaching poetry for over 10 years. Welcome to the podcast, Ariana. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm I so should have to be here. I'm so sorry. Please, please let me know if I'm pronouncing your name right, because if I'm mispronouncing, I want to make sure I, I say it right. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Um, it can go either way. It's one of those things. Okay. So you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'd love for you to start us off by sharing a little bit more about you, about who you are, about what you do. And I, I love when folks share their testimonials, so a little bit about kind of background, backstory, how you how you became who you are today. Sure. Well, I can say I'm from Texas. I've kind of lived in a bunch of different major cities in Texas, um, but I grew up in San Antonio um, and I was a very shy child. I know it might be hard to believe because I do, you know, I've been doing slam poetry and performing and teaching for so long, but before all of that, I was very shy. I did not like talking to other people. I preferred to read all the time, and a lot of that came from the fact that I, for a long time, I was the only Black person in my neighborhood and in my school. I was, um, my mother is Mexican-American, my father was African-American, um, but he passed um, before I was born. So it was just me and my mom. So I was even the only Black person in my house, which is a very unique experience. Um, and I felt very, I felt very physically different um, from everyone I was in community with, um, or the people that were supposed to be my community. I was constantly reminded of the fact that my Blackness marked me as different. Um, and I think that made me retreat into books because I felt like I could trust language. And I also felt like if I could just get better at describing my experience that I would have some control over what was happening. So I found poetry, um, I want to say in middle school, mm -hmm. and I kind of just fell in love with it. It seemed like, it seemed like the perfect vehicle for me to learn how to express all the things I was feeling, everything I was observing. Um, and because of my sort of racialization at an early age, I was really interested in history. Um, I wanted to know more about Black history. I wanted to know more about where I came from. Um, I wanted to know things about the history of Black hair and culture and all these sorts of things. So it seemed only natural that I ended up majoring in Black studies when I got to college. And that was so foundational for me because it gave me the language to understand power who has power in what situations who doesn't when do when do those things change right when are they contingent upon certain things and that gave me a lot of clarity around my specific lived experience I learned that I could look to history for answers as to why I was experiencing certain moments of anti-blackness or feelings of outsiderness in the community that I was supposed to be a part of right um and so 
I started writing about those things. Um, that's what a lot of my poetry is about, understanding race, geography, because Texas is a very particular place to be from, um, and how all those things kind of combine to shape our everyday lives. Um, so I've been performing poetry since I was a teenager. Uh, I'm 30 years old now. <laughs> it's been uh, 13 years, I think. Um, I got my start in community performance spaces, open mics, things like that. Um, but I started leading them pretty, pretty soon after I started writing. Um, I actually taught my high school's poetry unit uh, <laughs> in my English class. Um, and so I've been teaching community-based sort of performance workshops that are very focused on accessibility since I was really young. Um, this mm. idea that like, the way that we get taught poetry in school, it tends to feel very exclusive. You know, oh, we yeah. get, you know what I mean? Like we get taught Robert Frost and Shakespeare mm. and all that stuff is great. I'm rolling but... my eyes as a former <laughs> English major. <laughs> really? So English you know... major, theater minor. So I know about all the, whether it's British literature or U.S. Mm -hmm. American literature, it's mm -hmm. all white Eurocentric stuff. Absolutely, yeah. you know, and it doesn't reflect your own experience. And so when I found slam poetry, I was like, oh, this is incredible because you don't have to write it in a particular form, right? It doesn't have to follow these really restrictive rules that a lot of these older Eurocentric forms follow. And you can write about your life, right? Um, and so that was really, I don't, I don't always think of that as my introduction to accessibility, but I think that it was um, of me learning how to, how to teach different kind of poetic concepts or, you know, embracing creativity in a way that is inclusive of everybody that to the point where someone who doesn't have a background in poetry or maybe doesn't even like poetry can come into that kind of workshop and feel like they got something out of it. Um, so I've, I've basically been writing, performing and teaching ever since I teach a lot of online writing classes now, especially since the pandemic began. So that's a little bit about me. Wow. Um, it's, it's so interesting. I was going to ask you about your identities and how they influence the work that you do now. But um, you started talking about first your interest uh, in poetry as a way to be able to articulate kind of your experiences, but then looking to history for answers and then becoming uh, a teacher yourself and arriving at this uh, kind of notion of accessibility through rethinking how we learn about writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would love for you to maybe say a little bit more about that, about both your identities as queer, Black, Mexican-American, but then also like even being able to articulate the, the word accessibility and what that means mm -hmm. and how it relates to this notion of an uh, sus developing a sustainable writing practice. I know that's one of the things that you're here to talk about and mm -hmm. sustainability and accessibility are words that I know I use a lot, but I don't always define them, but I would sure. love to hear more about you, like your take <laughs> on, on accessibility, your take on, on sustainability and sustainable writing practices. And I know it's, it's shaped by who you are. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, how, like even you and who you are, how that is, it informs what you do. Absolutely. I think of accessibility in two ways, or I think maybe I kind of came into my understanding of accessibility in two waves, I'll say. So the first wave was sort of as a teenager um, being present in these community run performance spaces where everybody who was involved, um, none of them were, you know, none of them had degrees in English, none of them had published books. We all sort of understood that because we were performing spoken word poetry, that our work was never going to be respected by the mm. professional literary world. But because we understood that and we accepted it, we made our own community, you know, and so everyone that I was taught by when I was a teenager had a regular nine to five day job and they would volunteer their time in the evenings or on the weekends to host the youth poetry slams, mm -hmm. to drive the kids to the slam, to host the writing workshops that were free and open to the community. So I saw people really giving of their time and space and there was really this energy of anybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome, right? You don't have to like writing, right? You'll yeah. get something out of it. Um, and the fact that slam poetry is lends itself to performance, right? We had yes. a lot of, we had a lot of youth poets who, um, 
you know, probably did not love to read, you know, maybe we're not loving their English classes, but they loved <laughs> to perform. They wanted to write persona <laughs> poems as superheroes, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, so there was also that kind of just fun element of it, of it doesn't have to be so serious and restrictive, you know, you can kind of make it your own. And so that was sort of my first wave of like, oh, this is how you teach in a way that makes things engaging, fun, uh, interesting, right? But also clear, yeah. <laughs> clear to an audience, right? And in, in a slam, the person only hears the poem one time, they can't see the text of it. And yeah. so it also teaches you a lot about how to communicate yourself um, effectively and clearly, because the audience will let you know if they don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and, and I'm hearing about how it's also uh, a practice that is both financially accessible and um, and educationally accept accessible too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the big reasons that I came to writing in the first place. I always wanted to learn how to paint and how to play the piano, but you need money for those kinds yeah. of things to buy those supplies, to take those classes. Um, maybe one day I'll, I'll be able to afford <laughs> piano lessons, but you know, a pen and paper, everybody has that for the yes. most part, you know? Yeah. Um, my second sort of introduction to accessibility was, uh, was much more recent, actually. Um, when I was in college, I participated in our, um, our college slime poetry organization, which I co-founded. And one of my teammates, um, their name is Jazz Bell. They do um, accessibility consulting now. Um, but Jazz uh, lived at a, a series of interlocking oppressions, um, a few of which were disability and neurodivergence. And I learned a lot from Jazz, just being friends with Jazz and being on the same slam poetry team mm -hmm. with them of uh, what some of the things that they needed um, in order to actually, in order for the space to actually be accessible for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just kind of learned by watching, by asking questions, by listening to jazz um, and as their own sort of consciousness around healing justice and disability yes. justice grew, they shared those with me. Um, and now jazz does accessibility consulting. And actually I, I signed up for a consultation with them a few years ago when I wanted to start teaching virtual classes uh, during the shelter in place. Cause I, you know, I said, I have a decade of experience teaching these kinds of things in person, but now I have to learn zoom, you know, yeah. and now I have to figure out, I know during, especially during the shelter in place, I feel like everybody's needs um, sort of accumulated um, and as far as what students would need from a, an educator, you know, like people were experiencing unprecedented grief, uh, anxiety, um, lack of attention, right? And folks were yeah. really just needing a lot of flexibility and compassion. And I wanted to make sure that I was caring for, I always say, I always tell my students, we come to writing with our whole selves. Yes. And so it's my job as a teacher to make sure that your whole self is cared for right you can't we're not just going to come here and talk about craft and metaphors I'm also going to make sure that you have a break to stretch your body I'm going to yes. make sure that we do a grounding exercise before we jump into the writing you know when we talk about heavy things I'm going to ask us to take a collective breath and see how everyone's doing um, make sure captions are enabled you know um, I just taught a class with a student who had um, an auditory processing disorder and so we made adjustments as class was going on to make sure hey if you're volunteering to speak let's make sure you have a headset and that there's minimal background noise so just like kind of learning to pay attention and to be flexible on the fly about okay yes. someone's access need is not being met right now how can we shift things so that the majority of people's access needs are being met in this particular moment knowing that sometimes they will conflict but we're going to do our best to be clear and compassionate with one another as we figure this out yes you know um as someone who is disabled, chronically ill, and neurodivergent myself, it is um, so, what's the word for it? Like, I feel a sense of like relief to hear that you had someone in your life like Jazz to be able to provide you with that kind of education and support when they didn't didn't necessarily have to do that Absolutely. Um, we don't all have someone like that in our lives and some of us learn the hard way like I myself didn't learn about my own internalized ableism until mm -hmm. I got super sick uh, mm -hmm. and so now like the my lived experience informs how I work with everybody else and mm -hmm. I hear a lot of that like being flexible 
You're yes. saying like to be flexible with how you work with and serve others and teach others. But then I'm also wondering how that also translates to the the sustainable writing practice, going back to that, mm -hmm. uh, because I get folks who ask me all the time, well, like, how do you do things? And what's your what's your schedule like? And what do you do for productivity and blah, 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 blah. And mm -hmm. I am constantly saying there's no one size fits all. Yes, You've got to figure out right. what works for you, what helps you to be functional, what helps you to, you know, to not just survive, but thrive. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's a lot of like, um, trial and error <laughs> and yes. so I'm curious for you like what what's your take on how do you build a sustainable writing practice with all of this in mind with you you know mm -hmm. you are aware about accessibility needs and about different minds and bodies and spirits and how we all interact with the world in different ways yeah yes I fully agree with what you said about it's definitely not one size fits all <laughs> I am constantly telling my students that of and some folks is... get frustrated they're like just tell me tell right. me what to do right. <laughs> well that's the thing right is that everyone wants the magic answer when they sign yeah. up for a class like oh, I'll sign up for this class and then I will never have a problem again right yeah uh, but I do a lot of um being really down to earth in my classes and being very practical about, okay, you know, we're going to try some things. Some of them are not going to work. Some of them might work. And I, I tell my students too, and I just taught um, an eight week version of my class building a sustainable writing practice. And something that I said often is um, I'm going to make you aware of as many tools as possible, because there are going to be moments when you need to reach for a certain tool. And then there are going to be moments when that tool is not working for you. And we need to make sure that when you put that tool back, you have something else to reach for, you know, because our needs change because that is what life is like. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to building a sustainable writing practice, um, it's interesting because there's so many different types of neurodivergence and disability. Um, and some people like myself uh, really require a lot of structure. That is where my mm -hmm. neurodivergence leads me that I like a lot of structure. I need to have an established, you know, routine. And when things- me too don't happen, <laughs> I start to freak out. Um, but I know a lot of people, um, I have a lot of very close friends actually who are writers and artists who have ADHD and they are kind of the opposite. They need a lot yeah. of flexibility, accommodation, <laughs> stimulation, you yes. know, breaks, you know, mm -hmm. lots of new things happening all the time. That sounds stressful to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I'm my... laughing because I can a lot of my loved ones, I have a lot of loved ones who um need that that stimulation and mm -hmm. I'm 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 more sensory avoiding than sensory yes, seeking. Same. So I can relate to what you, everything you just said. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It is. Um, it's something that I have to pay extra attention to when I'm teaching because those are not needs that I have. And I feel stressed out sometimes when people are like, I had a routine and, you know, or I tried five different routines and they worked for a week and now I have to switch. I'm like, I, I don't know how you're doing this, but we're going to figure this out. Yes. Um, when it comes to specifically building a writing practice, one of the things I talk with my students about is a lot of us can recognize how capitalism and ableism shapes different aspects of our day-to-day -day lives, but a lot of us haven't really thought about how that affects our relationship with our own art or our mm. own writing. Um, and so we say things to ourselves like, oh, I don't know why I just can't sit down and finish this thing. Or I don't know, I just can't figure out why I don't have the energy to do this. Or if I could just have another hour in the day, if I could just, everyone seems mm -hmm. to think that they are missing the secret formula that everybody else somehow has for how they're doing what it is that they're doing. And I spend a good amount of time in all of my classes reminding people that there is no secret formula, that if you are tired, there's no, um, that's not a, a moral failure if you yes. don't have the energy to write, if you can't figure out what your practice is. It just means that you have different needs right now and you haven't mm -hmm. figured out how to meet them yet. That's all it means. Yes. Um, and you'd be surprised how often, even folks who are familiar with healing justice and disability justice, how often that seems like a surprise to them, that realization, because we are so hard on ourselves. Yes. You know, when it comes to whether we're students, writers, um, we're so, so, so hard on ourselves about the language that we use. Yeah. And a lot of that is capitalism and ableism. You know, we are, whether you're in academia or you're, you know, on the literary side, uh, trying to publish a book, there's so much competition for such scarce resources. And so you are constantly comparing yourself to another scholar or to another writer who is winning all the awards and getting all the publicity and has the kind of career path that you want to have. And you start to internalize 
all of that external stuff that actually has nothing to do with the writing or the writing's value. Um, so I do, I spend a lot of time, the, la- the first two weeks of my class, we just work on mindset shifts. Yeah. Um, uh, just realizing how much how much of our the way we talk to ourselves is actually really unkind and not yeah. sustainable. Um, and from there, then we look at practical strategies. Um, like, okay, this is what a writing routine could look like. Here are some tools. Here's some ways to be flexible. Here's some ways to allow yourself to be distracted, to follow that distraction, and then come back to the task you were doing originally. Um, so just building in a lot of a lot of flexibility and letting people know it's okay to not finish a thing. It's okay to just do, uh, what do we say? Uh, uh, halfway is good enough mm-hmm. <laughs> and good enough is perfect. <laughs> Yeah. And even uh, you mentioned the flexibility, but also curiosity. So even being willing to try new things, because sometimes folks get stuck on doing the same thing over and over again, that's no mm-hmm. longer serving them. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I'm glad that you, yeah, that's great that you're talking about the importance of the the mindset, mindset shift and of being mm-hmm. more compassionate with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and we you know when, when you're talking about developing a writing practice, I also feel like I can't not relate this to multi, not just, you're going to talk about multimodal pedagogy too, but multimodal Mm -hmm. writing too, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's another thing that I know that the title of this episode is not multimodal writing strategies, but Mm -hmm. we could have gone there. Absolutely. (laughs) And maybe we should, because that's the thing that sometimes blows people's minds is when Mm -hmm. you, when you. Uh, introduce them to the concept of you don't actually have to write in the same way that everybody else is writing Mm -hmm. it could be pen and paper it Mm -hmm. could be on typing on a keyboard it could be drawing it could Mm -hmm. be recording yourself Mm -hmm. it could be so many things so Mm -hmm. um, I just had to make that connection because I think that's also speaks to the question of like how do you make it sustainable and how do you make it so that it works for you yeah Absolutely. I mean, I think um, one of the big things is kind of trying to do a, trying to do away with these binaries of good and bad, you know, of like, mm. this, this is real writing, this is not real writing, this is good writing, this is bad writing, um, and just kind of getting folks to accept that there is no one good way um, or right way to do the thing. Um, and part of that comes from my training as a librarian too, you know. Oh, one, interesting. Yeah, say actually, more, say more. <laughs> absolutely. That's why I got excited when you started talking about multimodal writing. Because mm-hmm. I'm thinking about multimodal reading. Actually, one of the cornerstones of librarianship is access. Um, now, there's a lot of the librarians and libraries can be doing uh, toward healing justice and the way that mm. folks talk about access in that space. But one of the core principles of librarianship is equity of access, which means that anyone who might ever want to know information on a particular topic should be able to access that information easily Mm -hmm. in a format that is accessible for them. Um, And that is why libraries don't only stock books, that's why they also stock audiobooks and movies and picture books, right, and comic books and all of these kinds of things, um, because people deserve access, period. It's not a question. And when I teach my students, you know, uh, I did a, I actually did a unit on research and how you can use libraries for research in your own creative writing. Um, Because I think a lot of creative writers think that research is only for academics and scholars, but I've read some fantastic books that were heavily research informed. And so we talk about, okay, how do we take some of the elitism and kind of the stigma and the intimidation that folks feel about this word research and Mm. make it accessible, right? How do we explain actually a lot of people don't know librarians are trained to help you. They want you to ask them questions. That's literally our job. We would love to stop um, helping people with the printer and actually ask a, a library, you know, research focused question. That's what we really signed up for. Um, but uh, yeah, just letting folks know that there are lots of different ways to read. There's mm-hmm. lots of different ways to research. You know, not everybody has access to you know buying new books all the time but I always tell people YouTube and Netflix are full of informative documentaries that you can watch to learn that same information I assign a lot of podcasts um, for my homework uh you know just like listen to this podcast episode we're gonna watch this TikTok playlist you know just having things available in multiple formats which sort of goes into what you were um you know addressing with the multimodal pedagogies but that's really helpful for all learners yeah you know what I mean like Sometimes we think that only folks who are disabled or neurodivergent or chronically ill 
need a particular way of learning, but it's actually helpful for everybody if yes. the same information is packaged yes, yes, in different yes. ways, repeated, you know, we yeah. get to practice the things, we get to verbalize what we are learning, we get to talk with each other about, you know, our questions. All of those things are part of a really holistic and diverse learning plan. And so it actually helps everybody understand the concept better if the information is available in multiple formats. Yeah, yeah. Um I, I'm just going to keep saying yes. <laughs> I'm just echoing everything. Preaching to the choir say. here. Yes. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, I do, I have noticed that for myself and also when introducing uh, different accessibility tools to folks that I've worked with um, mm -hmm. is, is how much, like the more you learn about accessibility, the more it can actually help you as well, not just those that you're serving. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I would love for you to uh, say a little bit more about um, the multimodal pedagogies, especially um, how you have incorporated some approaches to teaching in the classroom and specifically the benefits and the challenges, because I know mm -hmm. there are challenges when you're mm -hmm. trying to introduce different uh, different tools, different strategies, technology, different needs, different mm -hmm. accommodations. Mm -hmm. And even sometimes the biggest struggle <clears throat> is teaching students who themselves may have needs, but haven't been taught how to um, advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, maybe talking a little bit more about, about your approaches and also just some things you've noticed about but I think you've talked about some of the benefits, but also some of the mm -hmm. challenges. Sure. I'm just going to make some notes um, so I don't forget to answer all the parts of the question. I'm happy to re-say <laughs> it. <laughs> this is my uh, my need for structure. My neurodivergence coming through. <laughs> Let me go ahead and make uh, yeah. some notes while we're, <laughs> while we're talking. Oh, me too. And I, I deal with brain fog too. And so all the time I'm right. I have my own notes on the side because otherwise... <laughs> my mind will go somewhere else. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, in terms of multimodal pedagogies, um, something I did for my my recent class that I taught on building a sustainable writing practice was that um, I assigned homework every week, um, which I'm not someone who really believes in homework, but a lot of my virtual classes only meet once a week um, for like maybe two hours. And so I assign homework because we just can't simply cover everything in that one meeting. Um, and it's helpful for springboarding conversation and at the start of our next class. But I try to make sure that the homework, all of it can be completed in an hour or less. Um, and what I would do is I would pick sort of one topic that all the homework was going to be on. And the homework is just kind of readings, viewings, things to listen to, maybe an exercise to do, uh, but nothing like writing a paper or something mm -hmm. like that. So pretty low stakes. Um, but often what I would do is I would try to find multiple formats um, for folks receiving that information. So say we were, we did a week um, talking on some of the issues in the public indus publishing industry and why it's so hard for writers right now. And so I had a TikTok video um, that explained how a book gets made through the traditional publishing process. I had a short um, online article by a disabled writer about their experience with publishing. And then I also had a podcast episode that was maybe 30, 40 minutes of writers talking about their experience in publishing. Um, what I also did every week was I told folks, you know, hey, it's great. I said, pick two of these, you know, pick two of the three to four, you know, items um, to read, to watch, to listen to. But if you don't have time to do any of that, what I did was I wrote a one page summary of all the main points of the homework. Nice. Um, so people could just read that. And I also recorded myself verbally reading that aloud. So if you only had a couple of minutes, you know, that week, because that happens, um, you still were able to access the information. And it was also a practice for me as an educator, making sure that helped me formulate my discussion questions for, you know, for lecture the following week of, okay, I just had to write this summary, you know, now I, now I feel even more prepared as a teacher um, on how to do this. There were a couple of weeks um, that were just hard, you know, when you are working with the folks who have a lot of different needs um, and a lot of different 
you know, off camera struggles that you don't see in the Zoom room. Sometimes folks don't have the time or the energy to engage with anything outside of showing up for that two hours yeah. that they signed up for. And that's it. So there were a lot of people um, who said, you know, I, I, I didn't I didn't do any of the homework either. I couldn't figure out how because I'm still figuring out what my studying systems are like um, or I just have a lot of stuff going on and I can't give any energy to this. Um, and so what I did um, was really just try to incorporate discussion questions that were specifically about the readings, but then also were just about the concepts in the reading. So maybe you didn't do the research, maybe you didn't do the reading on how a book is traditionally published, but I can ask you if uh, publishing is something that you have ever been interested in, and we can talk from there about what your goals are. So it definitely required a lot of careful thought on my part of making sure that I was trying to include everybody as much as possible, but we also did a lot of discussion in the chat and we also set up a class um, discord so people could engage with each other outside of class and actually set up study groups if they wanted to meet up and talk about the homework um, or you know do writing sessions together so we tried to address a lot of things but it is one of the things when you're working with folks who have such different needs is to acknowledge that not everybody's needs are going to be met a hundred percent of the time but I find that folks really do appreciate when you are communicative and mm -hmm compassionate if they can see you trying and they feel cared for and heard that really does go a long way yeah that last line is is so key because sometimes we're still learning on the spot you know as as instructors or on the other end of things you're as a student you might still be learning like what your needs even are yes. but if you know that you're working with someone who's willing to learn and listen mm -hmm. and be compassionate that's huge because mm -hmm. there's not a lot there's not enough of that I would say <laughs> yes yeah. yes I agree I agree yeah. um I guess one more question before we're gonna get you know close to to going to our final thoughts or your mm -hmm. final thoughts but Talk, we, you've been talking about sustainable writing practices, you've been talking about multimodal pedagogies and also kind of accessibility in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And we've already started talking about um, how needs are different depending on whether you're disabled, neurodivergent, mm -hmm. um, you name it. Um, so that brings forth also a question of, you've already shared that you try to uh, support different learning styles mm -hmm. but even that I, I I still find folks asking me like how do I figure out what my learning style is mm -hmm. and um, yeah so maybe like um, what are your thoughts on on continuing to the conversation on supporting disabled neurodivergent students in the classroom and, and also mm -hmm. helping people to support themselves so like one of the things I share is like a uh, link to like a uh, quiz that you can take to learn what your what, what is your learning style mm -hmm. uh, but there's also another thing that I know I share with folks especially if they have a recent diagnosis of mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. is the job accommodations network site mm -hmm. just to say okay here's some example of the types of accommodations you can ask for mm -hmm. uh, but yeah just in general um, your your thoughts on how can we make learning spaces more inclusive because you've shared what you've done but maybe what mm -hmm. would you share to other folks who who teach and especially those who teach writing in the classroom mm. yeah what are some some thoughts or advice that you would give to them if they if they're new to this if they're yes. like yeah if they're still trying to figure out and learn themselves and starting to notice I'm getting more students who are asking me for accommodations mm. I don't know what to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. there's a of things um the first thing I would say is uh you know I think um teachers work so much and so hard that sometimes yeah. um I imagine that it might feel frustrating um to realize you actually have to redo your curriculum mm. um you have to rethink this thing that you have already spent a lot of time planning and so I really, I try to encourage folks to feel the emotions that are coming up. You know, we're encountering this difficulty because the society we live in is ableist. That's what you're responding to. That's where that frustration is coming up. And if you're already overworked because of capitalism, right? Yeah. That it's, it's understandable to feel tired, to feel exhausted, to feel frustrated, but that's not an excuse for not trying. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and so I think a little bit of humility on the teacher's part really goes a long way. Um, 
because you no matter how fantastic of a teacher you are you still want to be teachable you know what I mean um and so for me what's been really helpful and what I would recommend to other educators who are trying to learn more about making their classrooms more accessible um, is sign up for some classes that are taught by disabled and neurodivergent and chronically ill folks because a lot of what I've encountered um, with a lot of able-bodied folks when they learn about principles of disability justice they think it's not practical you know mm -hmm. they're sort of like oh this is not in the real world you know nobody you know holds your hand or whatever those are kind of the responses that I've heard people say which is so frustrating right um and so I think it's actually really helpful just to see an example, see how people are doing it. And then you realize, oh, this is actually kind of easy. It's actually easy to set aside five minutes at the beginning of every class to review my access statement and make sure everyone knows how to turn captions on and how to voice an access need that happens during class so that we can refocus. That's actually not that hard, right? I just have to set aside those five minutes. But if I didn't see an example of someone doing it, I might think, oh, that's, you know, that's one other thing that I have to do. That's sort of the the attitude that I've seen from from other educators. So I think being teachable, seeing examples, right, purposely seeking out that information. And if you can consult with an accessibility coordinator, I mean, there's so many resources online, you know, teachers and professors, you know how to research, you know what I mean? So do some research on healing justice. I mean, as we discuss, it benefits your disabled, your neurodivergent students and everyone else. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's something that is very worthwhile um, and worth studying, worth yeah. studying. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I I, I, I mean, I, I'm just going to keep echoing everything that you're saying about the humility, about being willing to learn and to be teachable mm -hmm. um, because no one, I, I don't think there's a person who's doing it perfectly. <laughs> and I think not. even those of us that are, that have already started learning about it, we're still like, we're it's okay. I, I guess the only other thing I would add is that to remind people that it's okay to make mistakes so long as you're still trying. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I still feel like I have a long way to go in terms of my own learnings too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's good to even be trying. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now I want you to speak to my listeners, uh, specifically, uh, my listeners are first gen BIPOC students, a lot of them are undergrads and grad students, and some of them may be emerging writers, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, a lot of folks have this desire to, to write and uh, struggle to even identify as a writer or as a creative. Mm -hmm. And some of them are also pursuing careers where they're going to be teaching writing in the classroom. So what advice would you have for these emerging writers, and uh, new um, pedagogues, new teachers uh, who want to learn more about these topics, about building a writing practice, about mm -hmm. teaching and teaching in, in accessible and new and different ways? Yes, I think um, a lot of these lessons that I'm about to share, I learned from that early on period of teaching and community-based writing workshops. Um, my first um, piece of advice is to not assume anything. You can't assume anything when you walk into a classroom. Um, I found that that has served me well. If we're going to be talking about terms, you better believe I have a bunch of different definitions on a term. We're going to spend some time talking about that to make sure we're all on the same page before we move forward in conversation. Um, that also includes not assuming anything about your students' backgrounds. There's a lot of times um, that I have in the past when I first started, uh, when I started teaching writing workshops where I really wanted to teach writing workshops about um, family and heritage. And I had to remember that not every student is connected to their family mm -hmm. or to their heritage. Um, but I ended up teaching students who were adopted and had no knowledge of what their family or heritage was. So when I talk about accessibility, that basically means like, have you accounted for as many different types of people that might be in the room, um, even if you don't know this about their background, right? So trying to make things as open-ended as possible so that everyone has an entry point, um, that is really, really key. Um, the other thing I would say is, right, so sort of teach to the most marginalized, the most outsider person that you can think of, and then narrow down from there if you need to. Um, the other thing that I would say is, especially if you're, you know, a first gen, um, you know, student of color like I was, um, I would say there are a lot of moments when you might feel 
like an outsider when you might feel like you don't belong in a space. I know I had a really hard time um, being in very fancy places for so long because mm. I grew up without very much money. So I just, I just felt so physically, you know, uncomfortable in very fancy spaces where everyone was, was dressed up. I just didn't even know how to be part of that. Um, so something I would say is, um, you know, acknowledge the discomfort um, and work as hard as you can um, to separate your worth, like your the way that you think of your own worth and your own value from any external factors. Like if your relationship with your own studies, with your own writing is not intact, is not whole, is not holistic and, you know, protected, it's really easy for your relationship to your studies and your writing to be ruined by external factors. And so whatever your definition of success is, make sure that it's not reliant on these outside factors. Make sure that at the end of the day, whether or not you end up being successful or publishing the best-selling book or writing the, you know, the most cited paper of all time, that you know that you are an incredible person who has value and whose artistic creations matter. That is what I would say. Yes, I love that. And that the intrinsic notion of success is so important. Yeah. <laughs> it's the thing that I talk to my students yeah. the most about. A lot of that self-doubt that we have that's been ingrained in us is ableist. It's capitalist, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, this, this, I'm sorry, I forgot one piece of advice. The last piece would be to find a community find a community. If you, if you have to create one, then you have to create one. But that is the thing that will, that's the thing that got me through as a teacher, as a student, as an artist, there are so many moments of self-doubt. There's so many times yeah. when you want, you have questions that you need to be answered. Having your supportive people with you who are rooting for you, no matter what makes a world of difference. Oh, for sure. For sure. Thank you so much. I, um, we're, I, I guess we're close to wrapping up. I can't believe mm -hmm. it. I would love to hear uh, for folks who want to hear more from you, about you, mm -hmm. want to support your work, want to work with you. How can they reach you? How can they learn more? How can they follow you and your work? Yes, um, I'm all over the internet. So arianabrown.com is my website. Everything is listed there. I'm on social media, Instagram and Twitter as at Ariana the Poet. Ariana spelled like Ariana Grande. Um, those are those are the main places you can reach me. I'm not on TikTok yet. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you once again for sharing a plethora of knowledge, experience, everything, you name it, wisdom. I just was like, I feel like I could have just raised my hands for everything or, or <laughs> cl clicked my finger. <laughs> I so appreciate you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me in the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, here are three ways you can support the show. The first is to make sure you're subscribed and leave a review of the podcast. If you leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, you become eligible for a free half hour coaching session with me. Yes, that's right. One free session. Once you leave a review, you can email me a screenshot and I'll send you a link to sign up. The second way to show your love is to get yourself a copy of my free 15-page grad school fem touring kit, which includes resources on research, organization, grad school, and career prep. Go to gradschoolfemtouring.com slash kit to get it today. The third and last way to support my show is to follow me on social media. I am on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok with the handle at Grad School Fan Touring. Thanks again, and until next time.